viewers and or listeners, and uh, welcome back to Cookie Pocket, um, episode 71, 72, I think, wow. we're losing track at this point. Um, today I am joined by Christian and Mitchell as always, but Thanks. we also oh. have another voice on the podcast today, oh. uh, returning oh. voice from last season, uh, Mystery voice. Man, yeah. would you care to introduce yourself? Yes. <laughs> Uh, any fans uh, of Adam Sandler listening to the podcast might remember uh, the probably I I don't know if I'm out of my depth saying this, but maybe the best episode of, of Cookie Pocket. All right, don't oversell yourself <laughs> with uh, with with guest Nick, yep. filmmaker extraordinaire, and yeah. uh, former former classmate of Zach Garrigus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm back. I'm better than ever. <laughs> <clears throat> Alrighty, and, and today we're all going to be discussing uh, Andre Tarkovsky's Ivan's Childhood, uh, his first film, his directorial debut, um, and uh, also Christian and Mitchell's first venture into into Tarkovsky land. Mm-hmm. I figured it was time I I threw yeah. him in the pool, or or maybe the ditch would be more yeah. appropriate based on the, <laughs> based really on kind this of film. A... Kind of a muddy ditch, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Ivan's Childhood, it's a, it's a Russian film from 1962, uh, mm. and it's set during World War II, and is about Ivan, who is a young boy whose family were killed toward the beginning of the war, um, and works with the army as, with the Russian army as a spy. He, he goes behind enemy lines and spies on the Germans, and it's about his strange childhood as like a child soldier and also his relationship with these three quasi father figures that he has within within the military so without let's not beat around the bush let's just get right into the discussion what did you guys think of of ivan's childhood um well <laughs> there we go <laughs> yes if you if you if you would like me to start here oh I'll absolutely go you. ahead i just want to preface this by saying uh I'm a massive. You thought I was an Adam Sandler fan, boy. <laughs> I am a. I am an Andre Tarkovsky fan, if there ever was one. I I love him. I love him to death. He's maybe my favorite filmmaker ever. I don't know. I, I have a lot of. Wow. I have a lot of people up there. Um, this is probably my least favorite of his films. Um, it's incredibly uneven, um, but mm. you can tell it's it's there. The talent is there. Uh, I think. You know his his ability to, um, you know, in camera edit to to put a lot of shots together through movement is incredible. It's missing a lot of the sort of spirituality that you get in later Tarkovsky films, mm-hmm. but you still, it's it's it it gets across his sort of hatred of war, his his sort of ambivalence towards service to your country. It's incredibly complicated. Um, but you know, also probably his weakest film. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an interesting one because I always would have I would have said that I wouldn't start with this film if you want to get into Tarkovsky. Mm-hmm. Depending on your approach, sure. If sure. you want to, if you want to, you know, <clears throat> introduce somebody to who Tarkovsky really is, uh, I would say start with Solaris or something like that. But if you want to mm-hmm. see the progression, this is a great yeah. film to start with because it's the most unlike anything else he ever did. Yeah, yeah I, do, I do think, I think you have a point there in terms of the thematic introduction. I think I, I was kind of worried about run times uh, yeah. and, and didn't want to want to smack yeah. two first timers with a three hour yeah. uh, contemplative, yeah. very it's, it's, long shots. Yeah. It's not the endurance test that basically no. all of his other films are. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, speaking of an endurance test, though, I think maybe that's a good transition <laughs> to Christian. Do you want to let us know your thoughts? Oh, dear. Yeah. Well, I am the noob today. Um, <laughs> I know uh, little to nothing about Tarkovsky, but I was certainly impressed by this, uh, mostly visually. I'm sure we, we agree on that. Um, mm-hmm. I don't really talk about aspect ratios a lot or think about aspect ratios a lot when I watch and review stuff, but I ended up doing twice recently. I, uh, a couple movies before I watched this, I was watching another, uh, Kurosawa, uh, I live in fear, oh, oh, which is really, really good. <laughs> if you and, want to talk um, about Kurosawa, have me on. Name drop. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Next season. Uh, we'll certainly be coming back to him. Um, 
But there were a lot of shots in that and in this where I was I just wanted to see more of what was going on. But the difference being here, I think it's quite deliberate. Like every every like millimeter of, of each frame is filled with something and you you get this sense of like claustrophobia that is obviously very intentional. So yeah. I don't mean that as a criticism. Um, it's just something worth noting, I think. And the performances are really good, especially the kid. Um, he's totally convincing. Uh, somebody on Letterbox snarkily noted that child actors decades ago are better than they are now, and I think that's a decent point. Yeah. Um, I was just kind of maybe this is just the the noobness talking, but I was <laughs> I was hoping for a little more to grasp onto. Um, it's it's a visual treat, and I, I understand what it's going for, but I I feel like the the sort of frame of World War II is probably a little more compelling than what's going on in here story-wise um mm. i think the most memorable moments are sort of the the nightmarish sequences with his mother and uh beyond that it was it was still somewhat of an of an endurance test for me even though it's pretty short um yeah. <clears throat> but I'm, you, I'm glad to have watched it if you like nightmare sequences and mommy issues then you will love the rest of tarkovsky's <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what yeah i i i mean i gave this a three so it wasn't like Mind blowing for me, but I definitely intend to watch like Stalker and Solaris and, mm -hmm. and Mirror at some point. So yeah. yeah, I was impressed. All right, me as well. Me as well. I'm gonna preface this with a Kurosawa quote. Ooh. So I I have high. This is <laughs> this is kind of a um. Uh, what am I thinking? Um, I don't know. Appeal to higher authority fallacy. So we're going to start with that. I love all of Tarkovsky's films. I love his personality and all his works. Every cut from his films is a marvelous image in itself. But the finished image is nothing more than the imperfect accomplishment of his idea. His ideas are only realized in part, and he had to make do with it. Huh. And that, yeah. I feel like, Dang. pretty much encapsulates what, what I kind of thought about this film. I really enjoy every single shot. I think it... Really, there's nothing that could be made any different when it comes to the, the dreamlike sequences and, and the narrative structure and, and how, how each shot is appealing to a certain emotion and within the anti-war message. I just think that anti-war message is, is not like necessarily like fully realized or, or like, hmm. you know, it, it just seems like he's really trying to reach for something that isn't really there. Huh. And maybe part of that is because of the time period. And also kind of the assumption, you know, it's only like 20 years, less than 20 years after the end of World War II. So and, and obviously, you know, the, the Soviet culture and everything is still very much embedded in a, um, like the propaganda machine and a lot of the, the pro Soviet stuff coming after World War II. Um, and then this is kind of, I will say, totally breaches that like it completely turns that on its head. And I, I do think that's a magnificent accomplishment in and of itself. Um, but in terms of like just being like an anti-war movie, I don't really think it's saying a whole lot besides like what what it's what the visual storytelling is saying and what the motifs are trying to imply. And I think that's like a beautiful thing to look at. And I, but I don't think it's like conceptually very deep. And and maybe that was part of his intention, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but I I think it's it's wonderful to look at, and I totally get what he's saying. I think it, the message is pretty pretty obvious from the first like 10 minutes mm -hmm. um and i really enjoy that about it but um besides that it didn't really like emotionally like you know wrench me all over the place and, <laughs> and it didn't feel like it was you know trying to go deep in my soul to make me think about why <laughs> ivan's childhood is not really a real childhood mm -hmm. and you know it's great you know breaking innocence and things like that so i really enjoyed it but i mean it didn't like totally connect with me i don't think it was really that mind-blowing but i'm definitely interested in the tarkovsky works now I, I can totally see his visual style is very unique and appealing so mm. yeah okay yeah i i see i think it's interesting uh mitchell and christian that you guys have kind of pinpointed this as like a war movie or an anti-war film because uh, i think this is sort of a running thing with all with all Tarkovsky, and I think Nick, you've hit upon a good point that this is sort of the least Tarkovsky Tarkovsky film yeah. because this originally wasn't even going to be his movie. It had a different director for like two weeks, and then that mm -hmm. director was yeah. fired, and then Tarkovsky was was like saw the project and went, "Oh, I can give it a try" or something like that. But it it didn't really even like start as his idea necessarily. Um, so I think it has maybe some of the least 
uh, Tarkovsky of any of his films. But I do think a running thing throughout his filmography is that his movies are fundamentally about people and their, like, smaller issues, regardless of how wide the scale of his film is. So I think with Ivan's childhood, even though it's set during World War II, it's not really about the war, it's about mm -hmm. the people. And, like, yeah, Ivan's yeah. relationship with his three father figures and their relationship with each other. Um, something like Solaris isn't really about the science fiction, it's about the yeah. people and, like, romantic relationships and memory and and the same thing with something like the sacrifice isn't really about yeah. nuclear war it's about people and, and yeah. belief and things like that um so i think in that regard i like how this is kind of such a small little narrative that's confined to like small rooms and like you pointed out christian small angles and you kind of just get this impression of the war as like something that's happening over there yeah. it's very you peripheral. don't yeah, you, you don't want to go over there. And, and, and you go to locations that have clearly been ravaged by the war, but it feels like the war is always like one step ahead of them, or they're one step behind the war. They're just catching up to this destruction or just seeing it in retrospect, mm -hmm. um, which, which I think is really interesting. But I can understand that being maybe alienating or, or, or a bizarre yeah. way to, to approach the narrative for for somebody who's not maybe acquainted with that that kind of storytelling or that that typical mode that Tarkovsky approaches a story with um I do also we've also I think we've all pointed out the cinematography as like a really beautiful aspect oh, of yeah. this movie chef's kiss um, yes <laughs> there's there's so many shots in this I think that are I think maybe some of the most visually iconic of Tarkovsky's career because even though I think he has a really definite visual style I don't think he ever really does anything like this again, where he has so many sort of like shots that look like a perfectly framed painting. Uh, I mean, Tarkovsky has great framing in his other films, but these all feel so deliberate with their iconography and the, the, the silhouetted crosses and the sort of shattered wooden proscenium and the one scene. And I don't think you see that kind of thing with like leading lines and, and icons as much in yeah. other Tarkovsky films, which are a lot more about kind of the long takes and yeah. focusing on characters and vast expanses. Um, for me, it's a four out of five. It, it falls in the dead in the middle of my Tarkovsky ranking, and I, I do enjoy it quite a bit, but I definitely realize that it's very different from other Tarkovsky. Yeah. Um, something that we've kind of talked about before, um, not necessarily on the podcast, but that we've discussed before, is this idea of uh, state-funded media. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent of the BBC, which occasionally comes under fire Russia from Christian and Mitchell. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but this film was, um, it was partially funded and, and managed by the Soviet government. Uh, most um, film. Most yes. film, yeah. Um, most film. So the, there was kind of that, that, I guess, a concept of like the government is there kind of looking at this movie as it's being made and, and maybe from afar making decisions of like, is this okay to put in this movie? Is it not? So I, I did want to ask, how do we think that affects the film and the narrative of the film? And, and can you tell maybe yeah. that the long arm of the government is influencing the plot from afar, perhaps? Yeah. I feel I mean... the need to defend myself. <laughs> <laughs> but Nick, you go first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's funny because I think approaching this from like an American or a Western perspective is mm -hmm. like, it's you're not it's not incredibly generous because the way the russians see world war ii is so different from the way americans do mm -hmm. and really the way russians see the idea of of service to the government mm -hmm. um you know to americans the world war ii is this very sort of it's it was a glorious war and we were doing the right thing and you know we didn't have to fight it on our home front but to the russians world war ii was one of the most exhausting brutal just sort of like slogs in a mm -hmm. very long time that they had to do. Um, you know, it's they're, they're just hemorrhaging soldiers, millions and millions in these protracted sieges that last months and months uh, on their own soil. Mm -hmm. So I think even the Russian government was so effing exhausted <laughs> of, of the war by the end that mm -hmm. I think, you know, 
when you look at the kind of World War II films that they were putting out in the United States around this time, like The Longest Day or something like that, it's <laughs> much. They're much more gallant. It's much. I love, more, I love that movie. <laughs> it's a, it's a, I, I have to say, it's a fantastic film, but uh, it's just such a different perspective. I think yeah. the Russian government also. Yeah. This came about in the Khrushchev thaw, yes. which was a period in, in Soviet history when Nikita Khrushchev was, was very much trying to sort of ease relations with the West and sort of be a little more permissive towards anti-government sentiments. And you can see that a lot in the stuff Tarkovsky did that was, you know, he made these films with on Russian uh, budgets, like mm-hmm. with money bankrolled by the Russian government. And even other Russian war films, like uh, The Ascent is another great one, uh, that were bankrolled by Mosfilm, but that are incredibly just sort of like anti-war to their core. Mm-hmm. You know, the assumption, the, the base assumption by Russia is that war is always bad. <laughs> that mm. service is something that you just do. There's no glory in it. Uh, you know, the base American assumption is that war is gallant mm. and that soldiers are brave but in russia it's very much like we're just doing what we have to do <laughs> you know we got to defend russia again <laughs> yeah um yeah and that i oh sorry go ahead no go ahead i was gonna say having that defense perspective and, and defending the the motherland is a very like yeah. safe easy thing to do i think and i think it lends to the credibility of the film and definitely i, I think like really just letting you assume like that this war is awful and it's just a meat grinder and and you know there's only like a few seconds where you even see german soldiers yeah. and it's not even it just doesn't like you're not really thinking on those terms and i, I do think like the khrushchev thaw and like de-stalinization and everything definitely really you know contributes to the value of the film long term because i don't think it would have lasted nearly as long yeah. historically <laughs> if it didn't come from that perspective yeah. yeah, I I just want to say I don't think that like <laughs> everything the BBC puts out propaganda. is like is like pro imperialist propaganda or something. In it, <laughs> sure. I, I just I remember in season one, um, or no season two, when we introduced the week in review, at, at, like every other episode, I'd be like, I'm watching some British television this week, and you'd be like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Well, I, back then I was much more fond of finding excuses to go. Ah, oh. <laughs> now I'm I'm a uh, I'm in the, the sunset of my days. Uh, the September I don't of have, your years. I don't have time <laughs> for such petty hatred. Um, no, it's just another criteria or constraint, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I think mm-hmm. it's just worth noting because it's in it's another note of what a director is can or cannot do and is permitted. Yeah. And I mean, we were watching. Uh, Dr. Strangelove the other day and I think like the brilliance of that <laughs> is how much of the humor and cleverness comes in evading censorship so mm-hmm. that I mean that works so well because uh, he took that constraint and basically made his film better because of it yeah. And yeah. I think you could say that about pretty much any movie really and it's really hard to be uh, creative I think successfully creative without some real constraints because if if you're just free to do absolutely anything you want it's a lot harder to find meaning and uh make individual choices yeah. so star wars sequels happen and- <laughs> oh my goodness God. Uh, no 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 uh, not now yeah uh, <laughs> so no i think just i would almost call it then an accomplishment on tarkovsky's part that yeah. he could make something like this um yeah. when it's to some extent state funded i don't really have a ton of knowledge about the extent to which uh they influenced (laughs) the creative aspects of this film my guess would be not a lot Mm -hmm. but no but um, he was constantly negotiating against moss film and the russian government later in Mm -hmm. his career and it's why Mm -hmm. his last two films were made in uh what italy and sweden respectively Uh, yeah Yeah. stalker was his last uh soviet film and then he left because he just couldn't work with the government anymore wow Mm -hmm. yeah well, that's really telling, and I think that just makes his early stuff more impressive. Then, yeah. I would say. Yeah, I think I think I personally really love. I, I think the negotiation with the Soviet government in most film almost makes it, it's weirdly paradoxical in that it almost allows Tarkovsky's films to get bigger and be visibly better. I feel like a lot of the time nowadays, when you hear about somebody haggling for like, oh, I need this in my movie. 
uh, with like producers or, or a funding organization, they get it, but something gets cut out of the movie. The movie has to get a little smaller. I, I feel like Tarkovsky, it's a real kind of testament to his negotiation that his negotiation with the government allowed him to get like actual military involved with future films, allowed him to film on like massive factory blocks yeah. in films like Stalker, which yeah. To his own detriment. Him. But um, <laughs> uh, still, like, the scale is there, and it, it does make his films look better. I think a lot of the time when when films are evading censorship in the West, like you mentioned, uh, Christian, uh, it, it makes them sort of intellectually and sort of script-wise better because they have to work on those ideas to get around practical limitations. <laughs> I think Tarkovsky, it's almost the reverse, where he has to find a way to, like mask his ideas a lot of the time in order to make the film look bigger and, and make the production bigger. Um, which I, I think you don't see as much of with this film, because I think this yeah. is probably the, the smallest Tarkovsky movie. It's very confined. But I do think... I, I don't think there's any point in this film where you think, oh, well, that's... He's clearly being a Soviet mouthpiece here. I, th yeah. I think... <laughs> uh, and like you mentioned, Nick, there's there's not really any, like motivation to like glorify the war necessarily but but the film never really even I, I would argue that it never even really like glorifies the russian army or anything like yeah. that either mm -hmm. like like these three father figure characters that we keep mentioning spend a lot of the time just kind of bickering amongst themselves and there's <laughs> this impression that they they really are kind of running out of supplies and aren't especially well funded or supported and there's yeah. not like a feeling that like this is something we have to do, but the Russian government's going to help us out and push yeah. us through. There's just kind of this general impression that war is sad and like an, an awful like experience that just goes on and on and on and everything wears down eventually. And there's, there's not that, that seeming need to pump up Russia or pump up the, the Soviet Union as mm -hmm. you know the great red army or anything like that, yeah. which, which I think, it surprised me a little bit when I first saw it because I knew I was visually interested in the movie, but seeing it, I thought, okay, there there might be a few moments in here, but I never encounter those in any Tark Tarkovsky, uh, including this one. Um, it's just it's a lot of like ambivalence. Is, yeah, is mm -hmm. the best way to put it. Like mm -hmm. you know, the best you're gonna get out of a Russian film that isn't just straight up propaganda is like ambivalence. The idea that dying for your country is cool. It's actually kind of lame to not die for your country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's like the, the baseline sort of Soviet military thing is it's like, well, if you mm -hmm. died, you weren't, if, if you didn't die, you, you weren't fighting hard enough. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's, and that's, it's a really interesting thing. I don't, I hate to bring up another film again, but the ascent, <laughs> no, no, go ahead. I really would recommend watching it because it's a great, it's like, this movie is, is kind of oblique and not incredibly blunt about war. Mm -hmm. The ascent very much stresses sort of like well should i be dying for my country and it's like you have these two physically manifested perspectives that are directly at odds with each other it's only sort of mentioned and hinted at in ivan's childhood it's again it's a very yeah. personal film if there's any big grand political narrative in a tarkovsky film it's going to be filtered through the lens of how does it affect this individual character yeah the 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 little yeah. people in yeah. their little everyday interactions yeah mm -hmm. which speaking of the little people i think that's a good transition to talk about ivan <laughs> yeah. himself our favorite little um, person our favorite yeah. little person <laughs> who's really well he's he's the titular character of this movie and he's i think i think in terms of like ideas he's nominally the focus of the movie um, mm -hmm. But I, let's, I, I think let's discuss that. How do we think yeah. the movie handles Ivan? And also, any any thoughts on, um, I'm going to get his name right, Nikolai Berlayev's performance as, mm. uh, as, as Ivan? You, you didn't get it right. No! <laughs> I figured if I said it fast enough, yeah. it would just go, oh, I know what I'm yeah. talking about. <laughs> uh, no, there's a lot of like R's and, and Y's in there. It's, uh, it's a complicated name. Mm -hmm. But yeah. No, I, I love that little kid he's like <laughs> it's um it's interesting because i think in my in my letterbox review of this i was like he's just like really into the war <laughs> he's like yeah he's just he's like they he was fighting tooth and nail to get back out there but it's interesting because he might he's not the sort of like 
he's not the dynamic character in this film. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he doesn't change much. Uh, like I would argue that his his caretakers are the ones who are changed by him mm-hmm. more so than than he is. Um, yeah, I think I, I think it's it's interesting to to name the film after a character who might not even figure as importantly as the other characters in the film. Yeah. Yeah, I think sort of going back to what we were saying about the whole ambivalence thing, mm-hmm. um, I think it's at the very least morally complicated for, for the army to be using this child yeah. in any capacity. <laughs> so, I mean, that alone is, is, is something. Um, I think he's pretty much perfect. Um, yeah. I think there's... I agree that he's not very dynamic, but as far as appearing like versatile or different, I think there is a concerted and noticeable difference between like scenes with his mother and scenes with yeah. uh, the, the military guys, which is important. It's a great and, performance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. It really makes the rest of it work. Um, I think the others play off of him well. And yeah, I, I really have no complaints for him. Yeah. Yeah. I don't either. I found out something interesting. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. It's just a sidebar, sidebar. Sure, uh, sure. Last year, he was the, the actor was elected to the state Duma. Um, oh, good for him. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then he was sanctioned in March of this year by the U.S. Treasury okay. over the invasion. Well, so. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we are what getting are into do? politics. Nikolai, yeah, well, come on, do? man. Nikolai. Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, um, no, I think his performance was great, and I – I really enjoyed hearing what he had to say, and he, he didn't just seem like a, like, oh, man, I'm sorry, Christian, I have to make this comparison. Um, oh, Leia no. in Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh, I see. But I'm, okay. I'm sorry, it's not the what? same thing. It's not the same thing. Okay. Sure. Leia, Leia, so she's like that, just like serve her personality and everything, and, and I understand. I think she's great, and I think it serves, you know, as, as a good precursor to the Leia that we see in A New Hope and all that. But anyway, in as Ivan... I feel like he's at least dynamic in the way that he reacts to situations because he wants to be so imaginative and you feel like everything that he's trying to do is so constrained by the war, not in a sense where it's like he's like, oh, I want to play with my toys and the war is blowing everything up. It's like he's like really <laughs> he's, thinking yeah. about like how, how he plays a part in, in the greater war machine and, and, and why he can't like be a regular kid and, and not just, you know, just just exist on his own with his mom and not have that childhood that that every child should expect to have and i feel like that is a very valuable and and you know somewhat emotionally you know wrenching uh concept and i i you know it, like i was saying before it's not like totally reached and you know the the dreamlike sequences are very well inserted and 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 well shot and everything but um it doesn't like go like terribly far to film it that way i think um, but in terms of his like performance and and really, you know, being being the spy and at the same time having these aspirations, I think it's really well, I think it's really well done. And I feel like the dialogue that he has with the older, um, like with the lieutenant and everything, is is really, you know, I think it's really representative of that without not saying a whole lot. So yeah, yeah, I I think it lends to the tragedy of the film in a way that Ivan does so little. Uh, expressing of his own character and his own viewpoints. And I, I think it adds to that that kind of aspect of, like, what is this war doing to the youth and what is this war doing to the children? Um, that a lot of, like, what we learn about Ivan and what we think about Ivan is informed by uh, other people kind of talking about him. Oh, should we send him to a military school? Should we send him back away from the line? Um, I, I think we should, I think we shouldn't, well, he'll never go. Like, uh, those kind of conversations, mm-hmm. I think, allow us to learn a lot more about him than his own kind of actions, which are very much sort of like, okay, here's the information that I have, I want to speak to this man, and he's very forward and militaristic, and, and convincingly so. Uh, I think a lot of child actors, if you put them in this kind of kind of a, of a role, you might sort of get the impression that they were just told okay be bossy like yeah. like like order him around <laughs> which which is it's it's so much more complicated than that in this film where we get the feeling that he genuinely thinks uh he genuinely knows i guess to a certain extent that he has like authority over at least some of the people in in this camp and mm-hmm. that he he should be able to speak to the generals and he's going to speak to the generals so get on the phone now um 
And I, I do think that's kind of where he really shines. But the, the, the memory sequences and the dream sequences, I think, work really well, too. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the well, I think, is a, a oh, great, great sequence. sequence. I love yeah. that Yeah, mm-hmm. especially, it's kind of the only instance that we see of this in the film, but we, where we kind of, the camera moves physically within the space from kind of Ivan in the present to Ivan and his mother in the past, like yeah. through the passage up and down the well which I think is a really great kind of linear image of, of how much Ivan has changed and, and how he's kind of been forced to evolve over the years. Um, and I think that yeah. the, the final scene of the film especially really nails that home where we just see Ivan is dead now, but when this all started, all he wanted to do was just play tag on the beach. Yeah. Um, and, and that's yeah. kind of a, a really tragic way to end the film, I think. Um, yeah, that yeah, well a... sequence. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. That well sequence, it's it's a really good sort of, like, uh, he's sort of testing the waters about how he can manipulate time with, with the camera. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of filmmakers and a lot of films manipulate time through editing. Yes. But Tarkovsky is so good at manipulating time just with the camera itself by moving the camera. He can mm-hmm. expand time. He can contract time. Uh, it's It's one of the things that makes him so different and so unique as a filmmaker is that he can take something like a a well and use that as a way to sort of bridge two different times in one sequence in one shot without necessarily having to rely on editing hard cuts things like that Mm -hmm. yeah and that Uh, and that final shot yeah yeah. (laughs) that final shot when he he, the, the film literally ends with him hitting the the uh dead tree like he was this is like the war is what's stopping everything and i think that was really creative and and totally came across to me in full throttle yeah Yeah, that last sequence you're like is that a memory is that a is he in purgatory what what's going on here like Mm -hmm. you know yeah our dream for him yeah exactly (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah. and i think i this is calling in like another tarkovsky film but the way that this movie starts with a camera moving down a tree. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tarkovsky's very last film also starts with like oh. a, a camera yeah. moving over a tree. And it's, it's, it's a great, like you mentioned, Nick, he's, he's, he's really great at those visual elements that kind of remind you of time or an indication mm-hmm. of a passage of time, or even just a visual indication of different perspectives. Like there's the one shot in, um, I, I, I mean, I don't. It's not really a bunker. It's just kind of a room. But you get the impression mm-hmm. that it's yeah. kind of where the the generals meet and, and hide out. Uh, and Ivan is standing on kind of the the left side of the frame, and on the other side there's a mirror, and we see the officer's reflection in that. And just through that shot, we get this implication of how separate he is from other people and how people see him versus how he sees them. And it's, it's not like an overt thing or like a, an mm-hmm. overly forced thing, but there's still that, that idea of a distance between him and, and others due to the experiences he's gone through. Um, yeah. And uh, Christian, I feel like we've, we've kind of sidelined you for a little while. Any, <laughs> any visual thoughts on the film? No, I, I think I mostly addressed this in my opening comments. Um, it's I'm really struggling to compare it to anything else because wow. I really okay. I really do find it so individual. And I mean I've seen other movies in like a four three aspect ratio, but I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. you're I I am always like wondering like what does it look like like three feet to the left in this black bar mm-hmm. like all the time, yeah. and um to the point that it was like aggravating me, but I know that it was intentional. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he's, I mean he's like he's monopolizing he's capitalizing on every inch of the frame, which. I think a lot of good visual directors do. Um, yeah. It reminds me a lot of another one of my favorite films, Wages of Fear. Uh, it's an- That's another film that has sort of a similar aspect ratio where mm-hmm. it's you're just ever there's no fat in the frame. <laughs> Everything is useful. Mm-hmm. Um, and- he's he's utilizing as much of the frame as possible in this, uh, especially can like comparing it to later his later works where he's deals a lot more with emptiness. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. This feels very film school. It feels very like he's he's trying to make he's trying to be a very overt director here. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes to his detriment, I would argue, but because oh. um, it it feels a little amateurish. But mm-hmm. then there's also so many shots where you're like, yeah, this guy's a he's a he he's already just so good at framing, at visually, at visual directing, at moving the camera. 
Um, but he gets he gets a lot more tactful about it later in his career. Mm. Um, he, he feels a lot less like he's showing off like he is here. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me wonder, like, how many directors then and now just sort of there's like the box there's like <laughs> w- w- the the standard widescreen we see like in a theater and then there's like what most television programs are these days yeah. and i don't know i i am kind of curious to see like more stuff that isn't one of those three things just because mm-hmm. i think it affords directors more visual independence mm-hmm. yeah I, I do think that's a good point like and, and additionally um I mean, you think of directors and, and aspect ratios, and, and, and at least for me, a director that immediately comes to mind when you think of aspect ratios is, is John Carpenter, because yeah. John Carpenter mm-hmm. pretty much always uses that, that 2.35 wide aspect ratio, and that's mm-hmm. the ratio he sticks to and that he uses, but Tarkovsky <clears throat> kind of goes all over the place with his aspect ratios, and, yeah. and he'll use 2.35 at one film, and he'll use Academy for another, and 4.3 for a different film, but you always feel that it's a deliberate choice and that it's a, a deliberate decision to reflect some aspect of the story. So here everything feels really contained, so that, that kind of less wide aspect ratio works. Another film like like Solaris is, is in widescreen because we have this feeling of kind of the, the wide expanses of the universe. But it does, or it always like, feels... Like Andrei Rublev is another one that is wide open. It's a yes. massive film. And yeah. it's incredible that he did probably his smallest film right before he did his most yeah. expansive film. Yeah, um, that's... His most visually expansive film. Yeah. It's only, what, like a three-year, four-year difference between the two. I think so. Um, yeah. Which I I, I almost... Um, I, I don't want to turn this into an overall Tarkovsky discussion, <laughs> um, but like I, I feel like Andrei Rublev is one of those where it almost feels like um, it almost does have the feeling of like the blank check second feature yeah, that, yeah. depending upon what cut you watch does almost feel like a little a little too big yeah. um, it, it reminds me of I don't know it's a much more modern comparison but something like Under the Silver Lake where you kind of get the feeling that he had the world to work with and maybe went he a little too to far his limits anymore yeah. yes yeah like, yeah that's the thing about Andre Rublev that's so like he even said that he doesn't like the extended cut yeah, Tarkovsky's he's a fan of the more abridged version, not the television abridged, because that's there's like eighty billion different versions of yes. Andrei Rublev, like, <laughs> um, but uh, and the version I watched, I like couldn't find a documentation of it anywhere. Huh. Um, I don't know, but he is he always insisted that uh, the shorter cut was the one that he liked more. I think it it speaks to and he it, it, going back to the film we're talking about. Yes, um, yes, getting back on track. <laughs> he also Rublev or uh, Tarkovsky always talked about how he this was his least favorite film that he did. Mm-hmm. He didn't like it very much. Um, when you compare that to what somebody like Bergman thought of this film, Ingmar Bergman was in love with Ivan's Childhood. He loved it. Yeah, and it was it came at a time when Bergman was about to do some of his best work, and you have to wonder how much. <laughs> that th- this film influenced Bergman because a lot of his films in this era are way, way smaller than mm-hmm. some of his earlier stuff, like this, you know, the seventh seal or something like that. Um, you, you got to wonder how much this film influenced him. Yeah. And I, I know he, he cited this as a specific yeah. influence and I, I think even like the iconography or iconography here, like you, you mm-hmm. mentioned Nick, that it almost felt like Tarkovsky is kind of showing off a little yeah. like, there are shots in this, like, I don't think you ever really get a shot again, like, the, um, there's a shot where they're in the forest, and, uh, Masha, and... Oh, the white mm-hmm. forest sequence. I can't believe we went, like, 40 minutes mm. without talking about Masha. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna mention that one. <laughs> um, but the camera dips down into the trench as they're kissing, and you kind of look so up good. at this perfect triangle. But I don't think you ever get something that, like geometrically framed and focused mm-hmm. and iconic in a Tarkovsky film again necessarily but I do think kind of in the wake of this you start to see a lot more of that in in films by like Bergman and other filmmakers who claim they were very influenced by by this movie um which may partially be due to the the use of black and white because I think this is probably the most striking black and white photography in a Tarkovsky film it's it's very, I mean very chiaroscuro yeah. Yes, yes, which 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 may show up later on the rundown. We'll see. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we've we've kind of gone through my my roster of of things I wanted to bring up. But any final thoughts? Any extraneous things that you guys wanted to mention 
uh, before we before we close the book on on Ivan's childhood. I wanted to mention no. Oh. No. <laughs> I wanted to mention her, her one of her Carvey's Carnival of Souls came out the same year. Oh. And we kind of oh. had similar discussions about the camera work. Uh, we did. And and um we you know, I think a lot of the way that the uh the visual motifs in this versus how the the scares are executed in that film are very similar kind of with uh, the the first scene that comes to mind is the window kind of jump scare oh in the um, car in that movie yeah, yeah yeah the one in the car and then the one also i think she's in the bathroom like yes something, mm-hmm. yeah, that something like that yeah i remember that i remember that film. i remember stuff it was like last year <laughs> I did that. so um check out that episode um of cookie pocket but uh yeah i really enjoyed this yeah, i'm surprised we didn't mention the the masha thing um, oh, especially masha. with with the uh yeah and Big she's masha a fan. she's a she's a great actress yeah. and i think um, when you're talking about Zach, the the overtness of like the the disconnectedness, mm-hmm. I think hers is like by far like way more overt, and and I do think it, it adds to the to the dynamics of of the the child versus kind of the female child as it were, and, and kind of separating herself from all of the the men that are swooning over her, and she's trying to just mm-hmm. be on her own and do her own thing, and she really enjoys nature, and yeah. you know you see like the spinniness and the dreamlikeness of the birch trees and everything, um, which is also juxtaposed to the like the dark swampy mm-hmm. uh, war yeah. uh, scenarios and stuff, um, and I think that really works well and contrasting with the dark sky and everything and i just think all that is very it's it, there's a lot to eat like you were saying Nick, there's no fat <laughs> and, and i I, no fat. I think i i think that's it was a very very compelling sequence and everything yeah. um and her her expressions also definitely uh make the scene so but well, yeah I, the, I the interesting thing about masha is mm-hmm. that she's a perfect sort of inverse of ivan mm-hmm. who is this child mm-hmm. who wants to be an adult uh, but everybody keeps insisting that he remain a child, even though he's right. long gone, innocence-wise. And Masha is somebody who's constantly being infantilized by the men around her, mm-hmm. and she clearly is not appreciative of it. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. when in that that sequence in the white forest, he, she's being courted by this guy, but it's yeah. so uncomfortable and invasive, mm-hmm. and yeah. it's like you're watching and you're like, oh, I wish he would just stop right now. It's like, yeah, she clearly is not into it. She doesn't like being sort of treated like a child. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a perfect sort of like, uh, uh, what do you call that? Like a, she's a great foil for him. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I highly recommend this film for anybody who's interested in Tarkovsky. I this is my introduction. I don't know anything. Yeah. I am also a noob. But, <laughs> going um, uphill from here, I'll tell you what. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad. Yeah. I I'm I'm very interested and um, yeah. I I I enjoyed it. It's a very brisk ninety minutes for me. I didn't really feel very dragged down by it. Um. So, yeah. Three and a half out of five recommend yeah i you know i i basically echo everything mitchell said also i was way too hard on carnival of souls i really need to rewatch <laughs> that okay i really really need to rewatch it i feel like i'd probably give it at least a three on a rewatch okay but um anyway ivan's childhood <laughs> uh it gets a three for uh just being really visually en- engrossing i again i can't think of a point of comparison for the way that this camera moves mm-hmm. and um the aspect ratio and everything just feels uh, totally, totally deliberate. And I, I guess the three was for wanting a little more to latch on narratively, but uh, I'm certainly interested in trying more Tarkovsky in the future. All right. Yeah. I might, yeah, I might I mean, invite Andre back in future then. <laughs> <laughs> if you invite Andre back, you have to invite, I can't, you can't have me come on and talk about uh, my, my least favorite Tarkovsky film and then just bring on like Stalker or something like that and not let me talk about it. What is your favorite? Just so I know for future reference. I have to say, I think Stalker is my favorite. Stalker okay. and Mirror are the two that I okay. just love to talk about. Hmm. Um, yeah. They're incredible. Just yeah. incredible. You think this, you think the camera moves well in this film? Just wait. The man is just, and when he's given like a color palette Mm -hmm. it's just it's a it opens up a completely new world of like visual wonder you know you Mm -hmm. watch something like mirror and it just it feels like it glows it's such an incredible film but Mm -hmm. yeah three out of five for this one just based on like how uh how different and how much worse it is than everything else he did just when you compare it to everything (laughs) else which i feel like i would give every tarkovsky film other than this either a five or a four and a half Mm, um but this one, it's just, there's just something missing. And I give it, I'm hard on it, 
because I know how amazing he becomes later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think this has been interesting because I, I give this a four, like I said, which for me is equivalent to like great. Like I, I mm -hmm. do really like Ivan's childhood. And I, I also feel like, I, I mean, I really enjoy all of his films. Um, but I, I feel like I, I maybe look for different things than them, than, than some other people who, who watch Tarkovsky. Like, because my favorite is The Sacrifice, which is seems to be kind of I mean, an unpopular choice sometimes. I love The Sacrifice. Um, even though, I mean, it's it's like going, is this bar of gold as good as yeah. this bar of gold? Um, yeah. Maybe and, That and may be his best final shot in any film. That is, uh, yeah, that is a good point. One of them uh, is the, breathtaking, like... It's it's so hard if you want to watch them in order, which I would recommend. It's so mm -hmm. hard to like hold off on the sacrifice because that's like one of the most jaw dropping moments in any film I've ever seen is the end yeah. of the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And you, you hear that whole story about like the camera jamming and everything. Yeah, and, like, yeah. I have to see this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I do. I do really enjoy Ivan's childhood. It's it's. I, I love the story that it gets across. I love the visuals. I just love the sense of. Tarkovsky being there there's like a real brooding patience to to Tarkovsky films that I really appreciate um especially this season I've been doing the marvelous cinema tour so I've been watching all these marvel movies of quick cuts and people punching each other and it's great to just to just sit down and watch a Tarkovsky film in which people talk and shots are like two or three minutes long yeah. or maybe not quite that long in this yeah. movie but uh, and they will get longer in later <laughs> movies, and there's just that sense of kind of. It's it's I don't know it's it's like going back to like a a a good book in a warm library or something like that. It's a, it's despite the the ambivalence and the maybe negative themes that are explored in a lot of his films, there is kind of a a comfort to that style of filmmaking for me. Which that's a very personal review, but it's what I get out mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. Um. So all right, I, I guess that means it's time to move on to our longest running classic segment. <laughs> oh yeah. The rundown. Longest running. Ah, ah, um, down. <laughs> now <laughs> there has been a bit of a change this season though, Nick. I I, I don't yeah. know if you've been keeping up with Cookie Pocket. But Let's just um, say I have, yeah. All right. Okay, so, so <laughs> I'm being so targeted. Mitchell is the uh, is is the the target of the rundown. Don't send me to the front right. rather than me, so <laughs> All right, Dang. so I think we'll go uh, Zach, then me, then Nick, then Zach, then me, then Nick, and so on down the list. If that works All right. for everyone. All righty. We've got a minute on the clock. Is everyone ready? I yes, am. comrade. Okay. Three, two, one, go. Magazines. Three to five. Canted frame mom. Four to five. Two buckets of hot water. Four to five. World War Two. Four to five. This being our ninth World War II adjacent cookie pocket film. <laughs> five out of five. Flares in the night. Four to five. The name Masha. Three to five. The deepest well. Four to five. Russian child actors from the 60s. Four to five. Swamp reconnaissance. Three to five. Characterizing the Ukraine as beautiful and stubborn. <laughs> Four to five. Stealing a dinghy. Four to five. Kiriskiro lighting. Three to five. A picnic with your phonograph. Three to five. Remembering your college entrance exams, buddy. Four to five. Shattered wood proscenium. Three to five. Useless people who rest during wartime. Three to five. Running on the beach. Three to five. Crispy gerbils. Ugh. Four to five. Apple trucks. Three to five. Negative photography. Four to five. Uncomfortable woodland flirtations. <laughs> One Two second five. time. Oh. <laughs> okay. We, oh, we, we so almost good. made it to some of the best ones. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Tis the nature <laughs> of the rundown. Yeah. Maybe someday we'll get to them again. Someday. Yes. Well, we're getting close to the end of this episode, but uh, before we close out and, and say goodbye, uh, Nick, is there anything you'd like to, to plug for our listeners here today? You bet, actually. So if, you know, uh, uh, keen listeners might remember last year when I casually mentioned that my most recent film was not available to watch on the internet. Uh, oh. That's changed. You can oh. watch it. Ooh. There's a link, a, a Vimeo link that you can you can go watch my film Camille's Game. Uh, if you're familiar with Andrei Tarkovsky, then you will see a lot of of uh, that influence in my film. David Lynch, people like that. Mm -hmm. Very much about sort of memory. Very sort of 
spiritual, spiritual adjacent, maybe. Uh, yeah, give it a watch if you want. Uh, I had a fun time making it. My boy Zach uh, dutifully hung up the blackout uh, sheet <laughs> to black yep. out the windows hanging over uh, a uh, an open basement stairwell. <laughs> I was very worried that he would fall. We propped it open. We propped it up with like, like baseball almanac books. It was great. It was a fun time. (laughs) It was. Uh, It was also fun editing and watching every take. Zach uh, announcing the slate for the take with some silly little word. Uh, My favorite was uh, when when we were shooting uh, scene three V, and he said "Vampiros Lesbos." Which is oh a God. deep cut. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you, Zach? Yeah. How dare I, indeed. <laughs> well, all right. Yeah, make sure to check out Camille's game. The The link for that will be down in the description of at least the YouTube version of this episode. So, nice. yeah, go and check it out. Yeah. Um, and our next episode is going to be hosted by Mitchell. So, Mitchell, what are Hi. we going to be talking about next time? Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now. Oh my goodness! Going to Vietnam. I'm. I for some reason I just think Christian's going to enjoy this. I don't. Don't tell me why. I just had a premonition. I had a dream. I had a. I had a post mortem dream like sequence where I was running along the beach and then I saw Christian watching Apocalypse Now. All uh, cuts of it, so you shall see next episode oh, how uh, Robert Duvall, Martin Sheen, Marlon Brando, them kids do well. So you pro- it's probably it, good you didn't ho- have me on that one because I probably could talk just nonstop without oh stopping for air, waxing poetic <laughs> about how amazing that movie is. We had enough trouble just with the three of us. Uh, I definitely yeah. did not steal it, the episode from Mitchell, or I definitely will not steal the episode from Mitchell. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. That episode definitely will not be maybe the longest we've ever done if you discount our endless first episode. Um, We shall see. But yeah, tune in next time then if you want to hear us discuss Apocalypse Now. I know Um, I will. If you want to hear us discuss the horror. Um, Yeah. Yeah. But all right. Thank you again, Nick, for being here for this episode. Absolutely. Uh, Anytime. All right. And until next time, goodbye, everybody. Tip. See you.